play her own skills, and that's something that I think we all can learn from an awful lot. But today is the day for her to shine. So, um, thank you, Deandra. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my thesis defense titled Ground Beetle Species Assemblages Along Restored River Habitat on the San Lorenzo River Watershed. I use ground beetles as a bioindicator of restoration success to determine if restoration efforts conducted by a local agency resulted in improved riparian habitat. I would like to take this time to thank everyone who has helped me with my research. Um, my committee, named Dr. O'Malley, who assisted me since I approached her in the fall of 2012 and told her about how I wanted to do something with ground beetles. And Dr. Gershenson, who has been a great help since he's very familiar with the area where my sites are. And Dr. Bros, who has helped me with statistics since I really started getting into my data collection and everything. I'd also like to thank the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz and Semper Virons Fund for giving me access to their restoration sites, and the private landowners in Santa Cruz County who allowed me to dig holes and use their backyard as my restoration sites, um, my lab group, and finally my family. I'll begin with an introduction, including some background and research questions, then I'll go into my methods, including where I did my study, my study design, and how I collected my data and analyzed it, and I'll do results, discussion, and management recommendations. Rivers around the world are used for many purposes that can threaten the ecosystem services that they provide. Rivers are used for many purposes such as agriculture, development, drinking water, and flood control. Human disturbance leads to issues such as sediment deposition and eutrophication, which is a buildup of nutrients within the water and can cause things like hypoxia, which is a reduction in oxygen within the water. Concurrently and sometimes consequently, invasive plants not alter the natural riparian systems by changing the composition of plants that are present. Human changes to riparian areas can cause changes in the animal and plant species compositions or the animals and plants that can inhabit those areas. The diversity and the abundance of invasive plants has increased along global riparian areas. Also, rivers are susceptible to spreading invasive plants because of their flow and dynamic hydrology. Seeds spread fertile and damp soils and succession all make rivers prime habitat for invasive plants. Rivers also flow through human settlements, so there are many opportunities for invasive plant seeds to enter into riparian zones. River, rest and, res, river restoration projects are put into place with certain goals which agencies hope to achieve. Those goals may include improving habitat for target organisms, including endangered or threatened species. This could also include improving the structural integrity of the river banks by reducing erosion or the amount of sediment that is washed into the river during the rainy season. Other goals may include increasing overall species diversity and abundance, or getting rid of non-native invasive plant species. River restoration is essential because watersheds are not only hotbeds for biodiversity, but also an invaluable resource used daily across widespread regions. Watersheds are used for recreation and drinking water and agriculture. Over $15 billion were dedicated to our river restoration projects in the U.S. between 1990 and 2005. It has become more apparent in the past few years that maintaining watershed ecosystem functionality through <coughs> restoration efforts is a social and monetary concern. States and cities are beginning to see that the monetary cost of restoration is worth 
to return and improve riparian conditions. $2 billion were expended for river restoration in California alone, and river restoration was the most common restoration type. Human disturbance encourages the establishment and spread of invasive plants. This occurs because invasive plants reproduce quickly and can thrive in open areas created by disturbance. The degree of an invasive plant establishment is often positively correlated with the level of disturbance in an area. There are many reasons why invasive plant species removal has an impact on river ecologies and native vegetation along rivers. Non-native plant removal reduces the amount of competition between native plants and invasive plants, which are good at competing because they are good at utilizing resources. The reduction in competition allows native plants to thrive and grow to their full potential. Similarly, controlling invasive plant species reduces the number of invasive plants that are available to compete with natives and allows natives to grow and thrive without having to compete with invasive plants. Also, planting natives influences the amount of native plant seeds that are available in the seed bank along a riparian corridor and allows the plant species composition to be dominated by native plants. It will change the... Removing invasive plants can also have an impact on Um, organisms in higher trophic levels because um, changing the plant composition can have an impact on herbivores and other first level predators that eat herbivores like predatory insects. The metacommunity theory is an ecological theory that applies to all kinds of mobile species like herbivores and all kinds of predators. The metacommunity theory is the theory that species are grouped based on their functional abilities and the habitat characteristics that they are suited for. Because of that, any changes to an environment will influence the changes to the population dynamics of the species within that environment. A metacommunity is a group of habitats that are interconnected by individuals of multiple species and the abilities of those species to disperse between patches of similar groups. The theory predicts that any changes to an overall habitat will alter a species' ability to move between different patches. That means species compositions are influenced by a change in environmental conditions. For example, if an environment is invaded by an invasive non-native plant and certain species do not favor that plant, those species will disperse to a more favorable habitat and other species that are more suited to that environment, to the environment with invasive plants, will move in instead. That species dispersal results in a change to the overall species composition. Ground beetles can be used as a way to assess species composition by studying insect diversity, abundance, and distribution. Ground beetles within the family Carabidae are used in monitoring studies in many different study types because they respond readily to environmental changes. Beetle distributions change when environments change because assemblages depend on the habitat preferences of those beetle species. Since species are grouped according to their habitat preferences, when those habitat characteristics change or are altered, the species composition will also change. Beetles are used around the world as bioindicators because they are widely distributed in great numbers and are part of an insect group with many different species. Ground beetles are most active in from late spring to the beginning of August. In June and early July, in June and early July, adult brown beetles tend to emerge in the, from the ground in search of food and mates. 
Throughout July, female ground beetles began laying their eggs, which hatch into larvae about two weeks later. Starting in autumn, adults and larvae begin to prepare to overwinter and to back into the ground until they reemerge the following spring when larvae pupate into adults. Even though ground beetles are a successful group of insects that have occupied nearly every environmental niche, they are still limited to water availability and require moisture. They eat many different types of food, including small insects, plants, and decomposing animal matter. Some species can even eat whatever food sources are most abundant. Because ground beetle size and therefore total abundance is dependent on food availability, the amount of food that is available directly impacts the total number of ground beetles that can thrive in a habitat. Ground beetles are commonly used as bioindicators of river ecosystem health. They have a functional role in river ecosystems because they are decomposers, predators, and herbivores. Beetles are used in many studies to evaluate whether management decisions to restore habitats result in actual beneficial changes to the environment. They are also easy to sample. Since they are widespread and numerous, passive methods such as pitfall trapping or collecting insects by placing cups into the ground produce enough individuals to assess population dynamics. Distributions change when environments change because beetle assemblages depend on the habitat preferences of the species. Any changes to an area will be reflected in the collected ground beetle abundance and composition. Ground beetles are great to use for restoration monitoring studies because they will only lay eggs in areas where they suspect larvae will survive. That means species compositions and the preferences of those species will reflect the quality of their environment in past years or short-term environmental variability. Beetles also seem to be tied to plants since they are very responsive to moisture, which is a limiting factor for plant growth. Monitoring studies done on riparian restoration sites evaluate many different parameters which are used to determine whether a project is successful. The total number of ground beetles has been found to be greater in managed riparian habitats restored by restoration efforts compared to unmanaged habitat. Ground beetle abundance also seems to be greater in areas where there have been removed invasive plants. Ground beetles seem to be tied to plant communities because they are responsive to moisture and plants need moisture to grow. They also have been shown to benefit from increased vegetation cover and plant diversity. Because river areas with more plants have habitat complexity and host good conditions for ground beetles. Habitat complexity can also influence ground beetle species compositions because it provides a diversified landscape where beetles with different preferences can all thrive. Though I did find similar previous research that was conducted in California, like some done along the Sacramento River, that showed riparian restoration has an impact on ground beetle abundance, I could not find research that was done in an ecosystem that was similar to the Santa Cruz Mountains. I want to find out if biodiversity can be established by restoration efforts conducted in that type of ecosystem. Now I'll discuss my research questions. My first question was, are ground beetle abundances the same in restored and reference sites? Reference sites were comparable river sections that were located near the restoration site and were used as a baseline for quote unquote normal conditions. If I could show that beetle abundances are the same in restored and reference sites, then I can say that the restoration efforts improve site conditions so that it matched that or was comparable to an undamaged area. My second question was, were there any noticeable differences in overall species compositions between restored and reference sites? I wanted to determine if Restoration had an impact to overall species composition. My last question was to determine what ecological parameters contributed 
to any differences between restored and reference sites. I figured that the total abundance of different beetle species, plant cover, the amount of space that's taken up by plants, and abundance, the total number of plant individuals, could all be used in a model to predict the difference between a restored and reference section of the watersheds. Now my methods. All three of the sites I studied were along the San Lorenzo River watersheds, the San Lorenzo River and the Santa Cruz Mountains. Tributaries that flow to the San, San Lorenzo River and the river itself begin in northernmost edges of Santa Cruz County and flow down to the city of Santa Cruz where it exits into the Monterey Bay. The total watershed covers 360 kilometers squared and it's predominantly covered by redwood and mixed oak woodland, different types and different types of shrubs and grasses. About 16% of the total watershed area is covered by rural and urban development. This map here shows the location of all three sites and the layout of my restored and reference sections. Reference areas were less disturbed areas that I did not that did not have plant avert invasion or visible anthropogenic disturbance. They had relatively undisturbed plant communities too. My first southernmost site was located along Branza Forty Creek in the southern sections of Santa Cruz County. The restored and reference sites were directly adjacent to each other. The middle site was along Bear Creek. And at this site, the restored and reference sections were also directly adjacent to each other. The northernmost site was located along the San Lorenzo River itself, and the restored and reference sections were approximately a half mile apart. The site at Brenza Forty Creek was the most population dense of all of the sites. It was the southernmost site located in South Santa Cruz County. It was dominated by redwoods, California bay laurel, and the con common understory was blackberry, hazelnut, and native ferns. Restoration at this site included non-native plant species removal, and the non-native plant at all of these sites was French broom. Restoration also included erosion control along the river bank, planting natives, and natural recruitment. The total area of the site was about 40 meters long along the watershed, and the restoration was completed in 2010. The second site was located along, the, along Bear Creek in Boulder Creek, California. It was in a rural area with limited population. It was dominated by redwood, and big leaf maple, and the common understory was boneflower and native ferns. Restoration at this site included planting natives and removing French broom. It was along a river section that was approximately 40 meters long, and it was completed in 2009. My last site was along the San Lorenzo River, and it was not in a residential area. It was located near Castle Rock State Park, directly south of Los Gatos. It was also the northernmost site. It was, was dominated by redwoods, tan oak, live oak, and the common understory was redwood sorrel, foam flower, native ferns, and nearby buena. Restoration included removing non-native plants, planting natives, natural recruitment, replacing an old culvert for fist path fish passage and restoring 0.9 acres of wetland habitat. The restoration at this site was conducted in 2011. The agency that conducted the restoration projects that I studied was the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County. They have a number of objectives for the goals that they set out to achieve with the restoration projects. I focus here on the goals and objectives that related directly to my study. Plant community goals involve increasing the total no number and abundance of native plants through planting, 
natural recruitment, and non-native invasive plant species removal. Most of the wildlife objectives were set aside for threatened or endangered species, such as endangered steelhead mammals or migratory bird species. But the last objective listed under wildlife goals is to enhance the diversity and abundance of terrestrial invertebrates, which includes ground beetles. A study contrasted ground beetle communities from three restored river sections and three reference sections, which were either adjacent or along a similar river or creek section. Plots along all sections were 40 meters long. At each site, eight pitfall traps were placed 10 meters apart and one to two meters away from the water's edge. Four traps were placed on opposite sides of the bank. Plant species were recorded in each section using a quarter squared quadrat to eat, that was placed adjacent to each pitfall trap two to three meters away from the water's edge. Plant species and percent cover were counted within a quadrat near all eight pitfall traps within each plot. Plant cover was estimated for each plant species in increments of one to five 10, 5, 10, 20, and continuing on beyond 20% up to 100% and 10% intervals. Plant abundance was counted as the total number of individual plants within each quadrat. I used pitfall traps to collect ground beetles. I used, a, I used 16 ounce cups and filled each trap with a solution of water, salt, and dish soap. Pitfall traps were collected every week for 12 weeks. Plant data was also collected every week for 12 weeks. I collected data from mid-June in 2013 until early September in 2013. All beetles were stored in the freezer until I began identifying them. I identified them to morpho species using a dissection scope and made tallies based on their general shape. I later keyed those morpho species to species using a field key. I used SPSS in Microsoft Excel to do all of my data analysis. For my first question, I used a repeated measures ANOVA and limited the amount of time that I analyzed the data between mid-June and August. For my second question, I used qualitative comparisons using graphs. For my last question, I used a stepwise binary logistic regression. I since I was limited to three, only three sites, I was generally looking for any patterns or trends that could be with a p-value of 0 0.1, since I was looking for anything that could show some sort of effect or difference between restored and reference sites. Now my results. I collected and sorted almost 1,000 total beetle individuals, a total of 954, and all of those individuals belong to four different beetle species. The first species, Pterostichus californicus, is a woodland ground beetle. It's approximately 12 to 17 millimeters. The second, Ancominus funibris, is a common species and is often located along streams and rivers. It's typically between 8 and 9 millimeters. Clinaeus cumatillus is another common ground beetle species and is found all throughout California, including the central coast. It has a bluish tinge to it. You can kind of see it in that picture. And it tends to be 11.9 to 14.5 millimeters. Scaphinotus ventricosis is commonly known as a snail eater and is found in coastal ranges of California. 
It's typically 15.5 to 20 millimeters long. There are a total of 37 plant species at all three sites. 34 species were identified throughout the sampling season. Three plants were either too small or too early in the season to be identified to species. The site at Burns of Forty Creek had the second most number of species with 21. The site of Bear Creek had the fewest number of species with 17. The sites along the San Lorenzo River had the highest number of species with 22. Now the results for my first research question. Is ground beetle abundance the same between restored and reference sites? Using a repeated measures ANOVA or general linear model, I determined if there was I determined that there was not a difference between the relative ground beetle abundance or the number of species found at each site section at every site. There was no statistically significant dif difference, possibly because there was a high variability between the sites and I did have a low sample size since I was limited to three restoration sites. The relative abundance